Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Okay, uh, the introduction, well, thank you for that introduction. Uh, as was stated, I'm one of the founding members. And um, December, in, in February of 2006, we had a citywide meeting at a Black Star Bookstore on the northwest side of uh, Detroit. At that meeting, uh, it's about 45, 50 people attended, food activists, uh, community activists, educators, people in the municipal government like myself. And we met to address uh, food sovereignty issues in the city of Detroit, food injustice issue in the city of Detroit, and racism in Detroit's food system. So out of that initial meeting, we decided to uh, form the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. Some of the programs that were initiated after the formation of the organization is uh, our largest one is D-Town Farm. It's a 7.5 acres organic farm. It's the largest in the city. We uh, grow 35, 40 varieties of uh, fruits and vegetables. We also have uh, beekeeping operations there. We have a summer internship program where we uh, hire up to 10, 12 individuals from the community, give them agricultural employment. We uh, provide a life skills curriculum and leadership development. And some of the most promising ones, one or two of them, we're hired for the rest of the year. We also uh, initiated the Food Warriors program, which are partnering with uh, area schools for uh, children's nutritional programs. Uh, we provide uh, gardening at their schools, raised beds and everything, and uh, also uh, agricultural leadership in their schools. We have the Ujima, which is a key Swahili word, which means cooperative economics. The Ujima Buying Club has right now over 220 members. Uh, and we cooperatively purchase uh, produce once a month uh, from a nationwide uh, distributor, Unified, which is delivered to our office once a month and distributed among the community. From this initial buying club, we're phasing into a brick and uh, mortar uh, food co-op, which is the first one that's gonna be in Detroit in about 10 or 15 years. At that uh, brick and mortar food co-op, we uh, hope to uh, make it a, a community hub, which uh, incubator kitchens and uh, um, meeting spaces for the community, and cooking classes, offices, et cetera. We anticipate that this food uh, co-op will be opening sometime next year in 2015. As part of our programs, we also in, uh, influence public pol policy. The DBCFSN initiated uh, the uh, Detroit Food Security Document, um, which uh, was unanimously approved by the city council in 2008, 2009. And from this food security document, one of our most uh, fervent supporters on the city council uh, instructed us to uh, put together the Detroit Food Policy Council. Put that together with about nine, uh, 21 members from different areas of the uh, community. And that was also approved by the city council. But we have a lot of uh, speaking of beyond the farm bill and collaborations and partnerships, there are a lot of initiatives going on in Detroit. We have uh, partnerships and collaborations going on in a national level and at the local level. In 2011, uh, we partnered with a, in a community learning project partnership with uh, Black Oaks, 
sustainable farm in Pembroke, Illinois. I don't know whether any of you know about them. We also partner with uh, Oyatunji African Village in Shel Sheldon, South Carolina. Uh, DPC, FSN, my organization, and uh, also Why Hunger in New York. With this partnership, we shared cultural and technical uh, information in between all three organizations. We also have different plans for further collaboration with such as rotating apprenticeships, bringing uh, our youth to the different organizations during the summertime and giving them carpentry skills, agricultural skills, uh, alternative energies such as you know, uh, wind and solar. In 2013, there was a second collaboration on food justice impact initiative between the People's Grocery in Oakland, California, a social learning institute in Los Angeles. Why Hunger was also a collaborator in DBC FSN. And out of that collaboration, we're developing leadership development at the grassroots level, curriculum sharing, knowledge platforms on racial justice related work, etc. cetera. So there's a lot of partnerships and collaborations that are already going on at the grassroots level, at the national level. In the, in the local level in Detroit, we partner with the Fair Food Network on strengthening Detroit voices initiative and uh, this initiative was to build and collaborate with a network of urban farmers from the city of Detroit primarily African Americans and um, farmers and growers on food agricultural policy you know that is uh, related to policy that would directly in, in, um, impact our organizations and scale us up to uh, being able to sell our produce at uh, large institutional levels, you know, that's always a barrier with small small farmers and growers. Out of that uh, agricultural policy initiative, which I spearheaded, the farmers and growers came up with several policy points that were essential to their work and they wanted to see at a local and national level policy that would uh, that would help them out. Some of the policies was uh, soil remediation and contamination issues in the city of Detroit. A lot of city of Detroit is a very old urban uh, industrial city with a lot of contaminated land. We would like an agricultural review process approving large agricultural projects in the city of Detroit. So we want a panel that's gonna vet these projects and approve them. But there's a lot of large scale, uh, I say corporate farmers that want to come into because of the large tracts of uh, unused land in the city of Detroit. You know, they wanna bring in model cropping and everything else. We wanna initiate a uh, policies on animal, animal husbandry. We initiated our, or uh, well, we approved, and I was part of the task force that created our agriculture zoning project, uh, agriculture zoning pro uh, ordinance. But uh, we kept out the uh, animal husbandry because that was quite a controversial issue. So we kind of like parking lot that, we'll get back to that. Chemicals from pesticides. Another uh, policy was uh, tax breaks. We want to give small farmers tax breaks on uh, acquiring land for agriculture purposes. Land sales. We're looking for a fair, a fair, equitable, and a transparent process on acquiring land for urban agriculture. Uh, what's going on right now is uh, some of the big corporate developers are snatching up the land through behind the deal, uh, back deals, uh, political processes, 
we would like to start uh, put a halt to that. We are approaching the Detroit uh, Water Sewers Department to come up with a water policy for urban farming. Right now, a lot of the farmers just use uh, fire hydrants around the city, which have been kind of like winked and looked at, but nobody's really, you know, opposed it. We want to address SNAP, SNAP benefits for underserved communities and uh, more access of fresh fruits and vegetables to uh, the underserved communities. Food safety is a big issue. So, and the food safety issue is a prominent issue in supplying Michigan institutions with uh, locally sourced fresh fruits and vegetables. A community land trust we want the community land ownership and control of uh, public land. And this community land trust will ensure that the uh, land is uh, here for the community benefits and not just the large corporate uh, partnership that's going on. But Detroit is a unique situation. In Detroit, these are some of the worst of times. I know you've heard about it. But also, it's some of the best of times. In Detroit, as a city, and Michigan as a state, over 50% of the black residents in majority black cities have lost their voting rights. This is in the land of America, you know. We've lost voting rights and we've lost uh, self-determination. And these policies have been through a repressive, anti-democratic governor who imposed an emergency manager on the city of Detroit without any of the city's citizens' input. And this emergency manager has dictatorial policies, powers. He can unilaterally disband the city council, kick out the mayor, uh, council union contracts that were bargained for. The emergency manager took a look at the books. He had an ulterior plan from the beginning along with the governor and they drove the city into bankruptcy. You've all heard about that. And from this bankruptcy process, which happens at all bankruptcies, when you're talking about uh, city municipal levels, senior pensions are rated. The seniors in the city that have worked for 30 and 40 years have uh, had their pensions rated to pay off Wall Street bankers who were the ones that were responsible for the devastation, deindustrialization situation in the city of Detroit in the first place. Another thing that the emergency manager does is they sell off city assets. And the pension was what's the largest asset. Now these pensions were uh, pensions that were uh, people paid into their whole working lives. And like I said, an uh, average of $19,000 a year. That's not a lot of money. But they want to drive a whole population of seniors into poverty. They're privatizing city services, in the meantime, laying off thousands of middle-class workers. But everything in Detroit must be viewed from a racial lens to get down to the structural issues of what's going on in the city of Detroit. I don't think there's no other city in the city of, in, in America where the city would have been allowed to deteriorate to the portion that Detroit is. And is it because it's an 80% black city with a totally black administration? Just think about it. Would that have happened in New York, Chicago, Washington, D.C., L.A., Miami, Seattle? Why is that happening in Detroit? But there's a lot of things going on in the city of Detroit. There's partnerships going on. 
it's collaborations, it's grassroots efforts. Like I said, we're, we've started the initiative, DBC FSC back in 2006. We're forming partnerships all around this country and in the city. So thank you for allowing me to stay, say these uh, few words and uh, let's get some work done.